Hello and welcome. You are now listening to the You May Be Seated podcast. He's always better the second time. Yeah, that was a big <laughs> intro. I was waiting to see if you would, ca- would catch it. <laughs> well, what's funny is this probably is actually going to be our most formal episode because we're in here on a Sunday morning and usually we don't do that. Usually it's like 11 o'clock at night and <laughs> we're so tired. But now it's a little, little bit of the opposite. But we have our sweatpants on, and <laughs> yeah, we our just, basketball clothes. Yeah, exactly. Yep. Usually we're just getting off work, so we're in our work clothes. Yeah, <laughs> we just come in here and get right. on the mics. But yeah, thank you for joining us again, Tim. You were in here talking about baptism before. Uh, baptism isn't necessary. So, and what you reached out to us about kind of the idea, and of course we loved it. And then I turned around, reached out to you about this topic today because we talked about water baptism. And I think it's important. We got to talk about spirit baptism. We got to talk about tongues yeah. today. So I think that I'm glad that you did reach out because that it goes right along with that. When you talk about the yep. new birth, the water and the spirit, um, that that is the new birth message. That is the gospel, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so when we think in terms of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, it's the resurrecting when we die out to our flesh, when we're buried in baptism. Well, now there has to be a resurrection. And so that resurrection is the infilling of the Holy Ghost. Um, the Bible says that, you know, we are, we are um, you know, newness of life. We rise to walk in newness of life. Well, that newness of life is through the Spirit. And so uh, we talk about that and you talk about, you know, getting filled with the Holy Ghost. Um, it's a wonderful thing. And I, I, I tell as many people as I can when I'm talking about it, that it's, it's the greatest and most wonderful thing that can ever happen to you in your life is getting filled with the Holy Ghost. Um, it's the greatest thing that could ever happen to you. And, this, and probably the second greatest thing is, is seeing someone else filled with the Holy Ghost. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Seeing, you know, somebody that maybe... Maybe you've taught a Bible study to, maybe you've you've been praying for, and they've been seeking the Holy Ghost, and especially your children, or children, or especially your own children, seeing them filled yeah. with the Holy Ghost. Man, when when I got to see my boys filled with the Holy Ghost, and um, just this past year, Lincoln was at, uh, at junior camp. We have a junior camp in Central Pennsylvania where it's kind of like a children's crusade, and and that's why I was very excited about my kids going to camp because I knew. When they're in that setting and they're around all these other kids praying and singing about the Lord and learning about the Lord, that the Holy Ghost just moves. And and I thought that that would be a good place for them to receive the Holy Ghost. Um, it's just it's just a good setting, you know, yeah. for them to do that. And and this past year, it was it was really cool to see my son Lincoln receive the Holy Ghost and, yeah. and, and get baptized in the Holy Ghost and speak in tongues and and you know all that. It was it was a really a wonderful thing. And. Uh, and so, you know, when you're talking about that, you know, obviously it's, it's, it's a new, it's a new life. It's, it's a new thing. Um, the Bible says, any man, if any man is in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things have passed away. All things are co- become new. And I think that's why Jesus, and I know it is why Jesus, when he was talking to Nicodemus in John chapter three, he used the analogy of, of a birth, of being born. And he said, if, if, you know, unless you're born of water and of the spirit, you cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Yeah. And the Holy I, Ghost is going to help us. Yeah, today. that's the only thing. <laughs> if, if, you know, our, our flesh can't do it. If can't, we leave yeah. it up to our flesh, it's never good enough. Stuff like that happens. Stuff like that. That This is the fl- <laughs> <laughs> That's the flesh at work. Yes. So hopefully the spirit will be at work a little bit today, too, because the, the conversation with Nicodemus, I want to talk about that. I, I had I seen something the other day where someone said. I grew up in church and I grew up uh, in a family that, uh, of believers and, you know, do I need a uh, salvation experience? I think is the wording that they said. And I was, I was thinking about that and I'm like, think about Nicodemus. Nicodemus was the most well-respected. He was a Pharisee. He was a Pharisee. He was, yes. He was, he was part of the Jewish, the, the, um, the elite and he was very well respected and and very knowledgeable all of that and jesus went to him and said you have to be born again so he's jesus is saying this not to a gentile but he's saying this to somebody who did grow up following the law and of course if if the the old testament law wasn't the old testament law wasn't enough we know that but he's saying you can grow up believing 
and following. But at some point, you have to be born again. It doesn't matter who you are. And Jesus actually told Nicodemus when when um, he, you know, Nicodemus even said, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time yep. into his mother mother's womb and be born? And um, Jesus said, no, you know, you have to be born of the water and the spirit. Marvel not. Don't marvel that I said unto you, you must be born again. Um, and then he said, you know, you're you're a ruler in the temple. You're a, you're a yeah. ruler yeah. of the Jews, and you don't understand these things. He's that which is born of flesh is flesh, Nicodemus, and that which is born of spirit is spirit. And so, if you want to be, if you want to live in the spirit and walk in the spirit, as we have to as Christians, as people of God, well, then you you can't do that in, in our natural and physical state you have that has to be done you have to be born of the spirit you have there has to be a spiritual birth there now there are people that say of course like how can you say i'm not spirit filled you don't know and i live a spirit filled life i do x y and z but how do you know well, the Bible says, if you walk in the spirit, you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. There's going to be power. There's going to be power to overcome. There's going to be, um, you know, power over fear and over all the things of the enemy. And the Bible talks about that. But let's, you know, let's, let's back up a little bit and let's talk about what the Holy Ghost is. You know, what is the Holy Ghost? And that's probably a question on a lot of people's minds is, okay, you say, I need the Holy Ghost. You know, what is the Holy Ghost? Um, so the Bible says, and I believe it's Galatians, it says that you know, we have received the spirit God has sent into our hearts, the spirit of his son, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. So in, you know, um, in really basic terms that the Holy Ghost is the spirit of the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, John chapter 14, Jesus said, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God. You believe also in me In my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would not, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will receive you unto myself that where I am, there you may be also. Now, some people think, well, he's talking about preparing a place in heaven and all that. But really what Jesus was talking about, he's got, I am going to the cross to prepare a place for you. Well, what place was that? Was he preparing? He was preparing the Holy Ghost because the Bible says once Jesus ascended up into heaven, he was going to send down the, the Holy Spirit. Let me just read this real quick. It's in John chapter 14. Um, he said, and I will pray the father, and this is verse 16 of John chapter 14, and he shall give you another comforter that he may abide with you forever. Okay. Even the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it seeth him not, neither, neither knoweth him, but ye know him for he dwelleth with you. He said, so I dwell with you right now, but he, he dwelleth with you and he shall be in you. So I dwell with you, but. I shall be in you. And then he says, after he says, the father shall give you another comforter. He says, I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. Yes. Okay. So he's saying, I'm, my spirit's going to be the Holy ghost. Verse 25, these things have I spoken unto you being yet present with you, but the comforter, which is the Holy ghost in verse 26, whom the father will send in my name. He shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance. Whatsoever I have said unto you. Okay, now in John chapter 20, this is after he um this is after he died and rose again. Then Jesus said to them again, Peace be unto you, as my father have sent me, even so send I you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and saith unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. Okay, now they did not at this point yet receive the Holy Ghost, but Jesus was saying, Listen, I'm setting you up to receive the Holy Ghost. I I'm I need I need you to receive the Holy Ghost, okay? Because in John chapter 7. Now, if you go back to John chapter seven, it's a, it, it, Jesus talks about the Holy Ghost when he says, but ye shall receive power. Um, I'm sorry. It said, he that believeth on me, as the scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. Okay. Now, verse 39 of John chapter seven, but this spake he of the spirit, which they that believe on him should receive. Okay. For the Holy Ghost was not yet given. Why? Why was the Holy Ghost not yet given? It says because that Jesus was not yet glorified. So in order for the Holy Ghost to be poured out, the physical man the, of Jesus Christ had to be glorified, had to ascend into heaven. And then the comforter, the spirit of truth that Jesus spoke about to his disciples in John chapter 14, 
would be poured out. And he said, I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. My spirit will come to you. Acts chapter one, verse eight through nine. This is the one that I almost misspoke and said, said, said the wrong scripture, but ye shall receive power. Now you're talking about why we get the Holy ghost yeah. after that, the Holy ghost has come upon you yeah. and ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto other and unto the uttermost part of the earth. So he's saying in Acts chapter one, verse eight, this is his final address to his disciples. This is literally the last thing mm -hmm. that he's going to say to his disciples. So if, if you were going to leave your, your, your best friends, your, your family, and you knew that you, this was the last thing you were going to say to them on earth, what would you, you know, you would think I'm going to say the most important thing I can think to say to them, but literally the last thing Jesus said to his disciples. And this is why we know when he, before, when he said he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy ghost that they had not received it yet is because he said, ye shall receive power. After that, the Holy ghost has come upon you and ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the utter uttermost part of the earth. And when he had spoken these things while they beheld, he was taken up and a cloud received him out of their sight. And so I'm just, I was just going through that because I wanted to make it clear what it is, what the Holy yeah. ghost is. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And we can talk about, you know, why we need the Holy ghost. The Bible is very clear. You know, I think there's certain people that they might say, um, you know, they might have different views of what is, how do you know you have the Holy ghost? Yeah. What does it mean to have the Holy ghost? What, you know, what will take place? What indicators are there? Cause I see a lot of different answers, a when lot you, of different. Yes. Yeah. When you have the Holy ghost, yeah. but I think. In my well, there should be a consensus yeah. mm -hmm. that Based you do scripture. need yeah. you do need the Holy Ghost. And I think if you talk to no matter who you talk to that is that knows the Word of God, that studies the Word of God, they will say you need the Holy Ghost, no matter what denomination they are. Because it's it's very clear, like in Romans chapter eight, um, he said, You are of the Spirit if the Spirit of God dwell in you. So if the spirit of God does not dwell in you, what does that mean? You're not of yeah. the spirit. <laughs> that's, um, sort of, that's like what Jesus told Nicodemus. If, right. If, if you're not born, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. This isn't yeah. flesh. This is yeah. spirit. Yeah. Okay. So that spirit has spirit. to dwell in you. Spirit. He said, if, if the spirit of God doesn't dwell in you, you're none of his. Romans chapter eight. He keeps going on. This Paul says, this is the spirit is life. Mm -hmm. The spirit is life unto you. And then he says, but if the saint, if the spirit of him that raised Christ from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit, you know, after you're dead and gone or that day when the Lord comes back, if the spirit dwell, dwelleth in you. So it, it should, there should be a consensus there. And for the most part, there is mm -hmm. that we need the Holy Ghost to work in our lives. Titus says, you know, we're saved by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. That's how we're saved. Um, Ephesians chapter five, verse 18 says, be not drunk with wine, with wine where, where in his excess, but be filled with the spirit. Um, second Timothy chapter one, verse 14 says that good thing, which was committed unto thee, keep by the Holy ghost, which dwelleth in us. It's a given it's it, the Holy. If you're a Christian, Paul is telling Timothy, if you're somebody that walks with the Lord, the Holy ghost is going to dwell in you. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so, and so we know by the scripture that the Holy ghost is, should dwell in us. We are temples. The Bible says, yeah. know ye not that your body is what the temple of the Holy ghost. So if we're temples of the Holy ghost, the Holy ghost dwells inside of us. Now, I think the question is that a lot of people ask, and, and I'm not trying, I know you guys are the moderators here, but if I could just, you know, say the question I think a lot of people have is how do you know you have the Holy ghost yeah. Yeah. or what does that mean to have? The Holy what does ghost? it look like? What does it look like? Yeah. That's, that's, I think what a lot of people have questions about. Um, and that's, that's not, nothing wrong with having questions about that. And obviously as with everything that's biblical, if there's a question that, that relates to salvation, if there's a question that relates to, okay, how do we know that we have this? How do we know that this is living in our lives? Um, the Bible is going to answer those questions. So I think it's, I think obviously it's, it's great to have questions. Yeah. We should be um, inquisitive about things that matter and this, uh, this matters, but also we have to understand that we have to let the scripture be the answer. If it's not the answer we're looking for, we can't just go looking for another answer in our flesh. If we see that in the Bible, in the scripture, it tells us, it answers the questions we're looking for, then that is the answer. We're used to as people, I think, if we're working on something, if we're, if we have a goal, okay, if we're, if we're, there's something we're trying to achieve or endeavor, 
maybe if it's a little hard, yeah. maybe if it's something that is taking us a long time to achieve or to, to get to that point. Sometimes we try to find a quicker way. Sometimes we, some people make excuses of why they can't do it. Some people, you know, say, well, there has to be something different to circumvent around this because, you know, we're all trying to find the quickest way. But when it comes to something like this, no matter what the circumstance is or what, how, how somebody, you know, might have a, of, uh, a different perspective, we have to keep with, with the word of God and with the blueprint of, how, of what the word of God says about this, because it is the, it is the gospel. Yeah. It is something that pertains to our salvation. Now, salvation, um, can you just give a brief explanation of what the plan of salvation is? Well, the plan of salvation, you know, I, I'm not, I'm not going to, I hate to sit here and give my opinion. I'm going to tell you what the word of God says. That's if any, if anybody would ask me that, no matter who they are, whether it's you or anybody you else, I, first I would t- take them to Acts 238. Yeah. I would say, well, um, they asked Peter the same question in Acts chapter two. They did. And he get, the answer he gave them was repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Okay. Okay. So that's to, to me. Now I can, we could probably talk about that and have a whole pod, you know, yeah. and, and that's why we're doing, we're separating these podcasts because we are going through the plan of salvation. But if I could just give you a basic, if you, you know, and I, that's basically what you're asking. Hey, give me one scripture. Yes. If you can give me one, say one statement. That's the statement I would okay. make would be the same statement Peter made. Um, and, and that's why, you know, we're founded, we're founded off of, uh, Peter is Peter, the apostle Peter is the founder. Well, obviously Jesus, the, the church was built off Jesus. He is the foundation, but Peter is the one Jesus told Peter upon this rock, I shall build my church. Yeah. And what Jesus was saying, Hey, you're going to establish this church on the day of Pentecost. This is where the church was established. And so we always have to go back. And when we're talking about, you know, the recipe, how, how do you make, how, how is something put together? How is something built? Well, let's go back to the blueprint. I built what we, we build things at, at work and we have a crew and you might have six, seven people on that crew. Well, believe me, there's a lot of times where all those people might have different opinions about how this structure needs to be built. But at the end of the day, it's like, we, we, let's go back to the blueprint. Let's see what the blueprint says. Let's see what the engineers say. Okay. And <laughs> Jesus Christ and the apostles, they're the engineers. They're the engineers. Yeah. And so we got to go back to see what the blueprint says. We got to go back and see what the chef, the head chef said on the recipe. Okay. Don't just throw in whatever you want to throw in because if it comes out wrong, then the chef's going to be like, why didn't you use the recipe that I gave you? Yeah. And I think that's why we go back to the word of God. We don't, we don't go towards man-made creeds, man-made, um, statements. There's a lot of good people out there, a lot of good Christian and good Christian leaders that wrote amazing books that had amazing commentaries. Okay. And I think those good, those are things that are good to build up our faith Mm -hmm. and encourage us and give us a lot of insight on how to live for God. But when it comes about to salvation, Mm -hmm. I'm not going to direct people toward those books or those commentaries. I'm going to direct people to the, to the word of God. And that's why we're doing that. And so when you talk about, uh, you know, how do we know we have to go back to the word of God and how we know, and and what does it look like to have the Holy ghost? Yes. So now it says you, you reference X two thirty eight, and you, you quoted it and it talks about, you shall receive the gift of the Holy ghost. Yes. And that's in large part what we're talking about. So if you go to the beginning of Acts two, talking about the day of Pentecost, this is a great, place to go in the scripture if we want to talk about how we know we have received the Holy Ghost. Because we know throughout all of scripture what a spirit-filled life looks like. Now we're talking about how do we know we have received it. And it's it, Acts 2 starts with, um, and when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. There appeared appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire and it sat upon each of them and they were all filled with the holy ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the spirit gave them utterance so here i think 
This is even before that verse in Acts 2.38 where you yes. see the mention of tongues. And the mention of tongues here is that is the initial sign, the initial evidence of being filled with the Holy Ghost. So when it says in Acts 2.38, the gift of the Holy Ghost, and I'm asking you the question, you know, and we're, we're going through the question of how do we know we have received the Holy Ghost? We're talking about what the fruits of that looks like. But people, I think, a lot of times get caught up on tongues. And you can go back to Acts chapter 2. And, and, and even before Peter lays out the plan of salvation, you see that to they mention tongues. He mentions tongues in, in the beginning of Acts chapter 2. Well, if someone says to you, I have the Holy Ghost. Okay. Well, how, well, oh, that's awesome, man. Like you got the Holy Ghost. Well, when did you get the Holy Ghost? Oh, I, I really don't remember when I got the Holy Ghost, but I know I have the Holy Ghost. Well, okay. Well, um, and I'm, I've never had a conversation with anybody like this before, but I'm sure this has happened in the past. This conversation has happened. Yeah. Okay. Well, that well, well, uh, if, if you don't remember and nothing happened, well, how do you know you have the Holy Ghost? Well, because I believed in my heart. I just know that I have the Holy Ghost because I believed and because, you know, which is important. I love God. You have to. It, it, that is important, yes. but there's a reason Jesus was very deliberate in John chapter three, why he yes. used the analogy of a birth. Okay. Because when a child is born, it is not subtle. It is not secretive. <laughs> it is a very public, a very obvious thing yeah. when a child is born. Um, there is going to be, you know, obviously sounds being <laughs> made. There's yeah. going to be everybody is if you are in the vicinity. If you are on the floor or in the, around the room yeah. where a baby is being born, you are going to know that there's a birth that, that is happening. You're going to know. I mean, it's just, it's just, it's a very obvious thing. And so if the same thing happens when, when we get the Holy Ghost, it is a very obvious thing. It is, and if you look through scripture, it was a very obvious thing when someone got the Holy Ghost and you talked about tongues. Well, that was, that was the, the. That was what happened in, in the book of Acts. Anytime you see someone that, that got the Holy Ghost in Acts chapter 2, when they got the Holy Ghost, the Bible says they all spoke with tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. In Acts chapter 8, when Philip was preaching to the people of Samaria, when he called Peter and John down, the Bible says when they laid their hands on them, they received the Holy Ghost and began to speak with tongues. Okay, the, the Acts chapter 10, when... Paul is directed by the Holy Ghost to, Corn to uh, the Corn Cornelius' house, which was a Gentile, and his family. And he started preaching to them. The Bible says that they, that when all the people that were with Peter, which means all the Jews were with Peter, that came with him, were amazed that the Holy Ghost had fallen. Just like a birth, just like someone's being born. Man, there, there's everybody's going to know. Well, how did they know? Well, the next verse says, for they heard them speak with tongues. Yeah. And magnify God. Uh, in Acts chapter 19, when Paul is talking to the disciples of John that were not yet baptized, you know, he's saying, hey, you know, have you received the Holy Ghost since you believe? We have not even heard that there has been a Holy Ghost. We don't even know anything about this Holy Ghost. And in Paul's mind, he's like, man, it, well, if you've been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, how do you not have the Holy Ghost? And they said, well, we, we weren't even baptized in that name. And he, was, he said, well, I got it for, you know, we go back to the baptism episode. He said, I have to baptize you the right way first. So he baptized them the right way. And then they received the Holy Ghost. Okay. Spake with tongues. So these are the instances in the Bible that we have of people receiving the Holy Ghost. And every single time there is that it talks about this, it talks about them speaking with tongues. That is the evidence of of, of the Holy Ghost in their lives. And, you know, you can look back, we can look back and think about, you know, when we receive the Holy Ghost, when yeah. we've seen people receive the Holy Ghost, how special of a moment it is when we see the Holy Ghost come on them and they begin to speak with other tongues, something that is not rehearsed, something that is not, um, not something that is, it goes beyond our cognitive reasoning. And nothing we can learn in a classroom. It's something with the Holy Ghost. You see the tears well up in their eyes. And you see there's an overflow. And when the Holy Ghost, you're filled with the Holy Ghost. Well, with your, when you're filled, there's going to be an overflow in your life. And that overflow happens. When that happens, they, they just like the Bible says, out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water. And you see that person speak with tongues. It's a special, it's a, it's a wonderful moment in our lives and in anybody who's ever received the Holy Ghost, we see that. 
And I, it's funny, yesterday I was actually talking to my father-in-law about the story um, or the passage of uh, Jesus and Nicodemus. And it is interesting how Jesus says to be born again of water and spirit. He uses water and spirit. And there are two things. There are, there, you cannot deny water when you are baptized. Because why? The water hits your face. You are baptized. You are, you are, yes. you go back to the episode, you are completely submerged in the water. And you cannot deny that you're under the water. Nobody can that's watching. It's you undeniable. Get, it's undeniable. But the Holy Ghost, when you receive the Holy Ghost, it's undeniable. It has to be undeniable. Now, you could say, why yeah. did the Lord choose tongues? Well, there are, there are several different reasons that we can go through. But, you know, why didn't he choose everybody's, you know, uh, everybody spinning around or picking everybody up? And look, could you imagine every, multiple people getting the Holy Ghost in a service and it'd be something other than tongues, like the chaos and confusion that that would cause? <laughs> but And God is not the author of confusion. Yeah. Yeah. So I think the languages, and we can go back to like the Tower of Babel and how the languages are confounded and yeah. God brought back the, you know, went back and now there's a heavenly language. We can go to James chapter three and talk about three verse you know, eight. how how the tongue is the most unruly member of the body. It, says it cannot be tamed. The tongue, yeah, can no man tame. No man, it can't be tamed. Well, God's saying, okay, you say it can't be tamed. I'm going to show you through the spirit. Through the flesh, it can't be tamed, but through the spirit. Now it's not something that you're doing. It's something that the Holy Ghost, mm -hmm. it's a supernatural thing. It's a divine thing. And going back, you know, one of the things that you know, when you talk about tongues, I mean, we're talking about a birth. Yeah. Um, you know, one of the first things that they do, you know, when they want to see a healthy child, they want to see the, they want to hear the lungs. Yeah. They want to hear that sound. That's why they smack the baby a little bit. <laughs> they want to hear that sound come out. Yeah. They know, okay, we have a healthy baby. That's mm -hmm. the first thing you hear is, you know, when you hear that, that sound of the baby crying, yeah. the baby screaming. It's like, okay, we know there's a birth. The, the, the baby's alive. Yeah. That's the first thing you hear is a sound. And isn't it amazing? Jesus, I didn't use the analogy of a birth. Jesus did. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Jesus did. And yeah. so the re and, and as Jesus used that analogy of the birth, the first thing you're what you want to hear in a fleshly birth is the is, is that sound. Same thing with the spirit birth. It's going to be through, it's going to be the tongues is going to be the evidence. And once again, this is something all through the book of Acts that was the evidence of the Holy Ghost. It's our blueprint. It's yeah. our recipe. And so that's how we know now, as far as like living in the Holy Ghost, the fruits of the spirit, love, joy, peace, long suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Those are how other people will see that we're living in the Holy Ghost, that we have the Holy Ghost. The Bible says that ye shall know them by their fruits. Yeah. Okay. You're going to know them by the fruits that they have, that they're living in the Holy Ghost. So we're going to love one another. We're going to have peace. We're going to have joy that is unspeakable and full of glory. We're going to have those things. We're going to have, you know, meekness, temperance, um, long suffering. And so faith, we're going to have those things. And so that's how, you know, you can, you can tell the people of God that you can tell them by their fruits and you can tell them by their loved one to another. Yeah. And, and, and you're going to, you're going to have power to overcome the flesh. Mm -hmm. And I feel like there's certain people that, you know, they just fall back and, you know, if they don't truly have the Holy ghost or truly have, you know, the, the baptism of the Holy ghost and the Holy ghost, Holy ghost working in their lives, the Bible talks about this. They're constantly slaves to sin. They're slaves to the flesh. Yeah. But if you're born of the spirit, it's not that the flesh doesn't, the flesh is still there, but you have power to let the spirit overcome the flesh. Yeah. Yeah. So, yes, you get access to you that get power. access to, 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 yes. a, to, to a, to a new dimension, to yeah. a new realm, um, to, to, you know, you have new life. You're a new creature. And that, and our, it's something our flesh cannot understand. You know, we're born in sin, shaping in iniquity, but that's why it's so important to be born again. Because when you are born again, you take on Jesus Christ. The carnal mind yes. does not understand the things of God. They are spiritually discerned. So we can't, you know, we can't reach God with physical factors alone. You know, we need more than just, you know, the physical factors. We have a God that relates to us by means of the spiritual. Okay, the spirit, the carnal mind understandeth not the, the things of God. Okay, you have to have the spirit working in your life. And that's why when you get the Holy Ghost, just as with a baby that's born, 
I, you know, I know you might be getting sick and tired of me going back to this, but once again, Jesus is the one that used the analogy. Yeah. Okay. Just like you go look, talking about a baby being born, when it comes out of the womb, its whole world was in the womb. That's all it knew, right? Yeah. That was its whole world, darkness and and that little you know space in the womb. Now all of a sudden, it's opening its eyes. That little bit of light is just is just killing it because yeah. it's just it's not used to that. Yeah. It's not used to the light. All it's used to is the darkness. But now it has a whole new perspective on life. It's 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 seeing things in a whole new way. It's seeing the world around it in the whole new way. It's seeing you know people hearing voices and seeing all these different things for the first time. And that's the way it is. And, and you talk about like, so how, so how can we not have a definitive moment yeah. when we are born of the yeah. Holy Ghost? Just like there is a definitive moment when that baby comes out of the womb for the first time and everything is different. Yeah. Everything changes. Okay. And so that's, that's why there is a definitive thing. When you get the Holy Ghost, you will speak with tongues. You will know. The devil will not be able to take that away from you. Oh, how do you know? Do you really have the Holy Ghost? Well, listen, I had an experience. I spoke with tongues, just as the Bible says, just as Acts chapter 2 and Acts chapter 8 and Acts chapter 10 and Acts chapter 19, just as all those verses say. I spoke with tongues and received the Holy Ghost as the Bible said. I know I have it. I, you can't take that away from me. The devil can't take it away. The world can't take it away. No other you know, so-called denomination can take it away. Because you you had the same experience that they had at the day of Pentecost and in the book of Acts. Yeah, absolutely. And I yeah. think it's such a, like you said, it's such a, um, you can pin it to an event or an occasion when you when you receive the Holy Ghost. Like, like you said, your son receiving the Holy Ghost at junior camp last year. I remember the day or the year that I received the Holy Ghost at junior camp as well. I remember who prayed for me you know, the night actually of the week, you know, of the service. And I, I remember almost everything about that. And that was years ago. And it was just such a special, like special day to me. Cause you, you just remember everything about that moment. Um, and even as a young, as a young child, you can just remember your life being, being changed for the better. But as you were saying, when you, when you step into that, uh, role as a new creature, after the being baptized with the spirit, you walk in that power. And I, I like to, you know, it's almost like a, a new confounding like conviction when you come across, uh, like you said, everybody's going to be tempted or, or, or deal with temptations. Um, even people filled with the, with the spirit, but you, you have this new sense of conviction when you come a new sense of wanting to purify your life essentially um to walk with god in a in a better sense and i'll, I'll say this real quick my my grandma who now goes to church with us um she came from a background where we talked about in the beginning you know i i how do you how are you to say that i don't have the spirit of god with me she came from a one of those denominations where um, the salvation plan was, you know, good works, get you to heaven, you're saved, you know, um, that kind of salvation plan. But when she started coming to church and, and <laughs> I remember one of her first services, she came, came and asked, you know, what was that guy saying? You know what I mean? Like when, when the preacher was speaking in tongues and we had a conversation with her and it, you know, maybe not registering as fast, but she was like, well, why do, why do I, why does someone need to, to speak in tongues? She still wasn't understanding, Hey, I, you know, I'm walking uh, right. in the spirit, but knowing when, when you speak in tongues, there is a definitive moment when, or, or evidence thereof that God has entered, you know, into you essentially. Um, she, she eventually, long story short, she eventually got the Holy ghost and she, I, she can tell you the exact day she got the Holy ghost and, and how life changing it was that, that moment that she got the Holy ghost and that understanding that came with it of, you know, she feels like a new, that's how she des described it when asked, you know, how do you feel? I feel new. You know what I mean? I feel. 
I feel refreshed. I feel like a brand new person. And that's what it is almost essentially. You're, um, yeah, taking on a, a new sense of power in a sense. Yeah. But We don't say, hey, you know, you need to speak in tongues. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, yeah. I mean, that's the, that is the evidence yeah. and, and that is how you're going to know you're going to speak in tongues, but we don't seek after necessarily the tongues. Yes. Yes. You know, we know that, you know, that is the evidence, but what happens is that comes after you, when you get the Holy ghost, then you speak in tongues. Like you, once you get the Holy ghost, it's just like the baby, like, you know, the baby doesn't make a sound before it's born. Yeah. And, you know, you don't hear that crying in the womb. Once it, it, it's born, then it cries. Then it, you hear the sound, then it has the new perspective. Yeah. Okay. That, so we don't say, you know, that we, the reason why we talk about that is because we know once we see that, listen, we can celebrate, <laughs> we can all celebrate and we can all rejoice because there's a new creature born. Because there's a new baby born in Christ, because there's a you know there's a new member of the body of Christ of the family of the Lord, mm -hmm. and so now we can celebrate, we can all rejoice, just like your grandmother. You know, we can all, you're just, yeah. you know, Sister Mary, she got the Holy Ghost. You know, yeah. we know it. We we all we we saw we you know we confirmed that she spoke with tongues. Mm -hmm. so we know that she's a new creature in Christ Jesus, and now you see the development. Yeah, you know of that of that. Uh, new creature. Now you see the discipleship and, you know, she went through the discipleship class. Now you yeah. see the growth, yeah. you know, and she's growing and growing each and every day in the Lord as we all are, Yeah, you know, and, um, and it takes an element of faith and there is a wall that has to be broken down to get to that point. And uh, like it says, like I read the enmity, the carnal mind is enmity against God. That is a strong word to use for that because if your carnal mind is the enemy of God, it's not just that your flesh is having a hard time understanding uh, the spiritual minded uh, of life and peace of being born again of, this, uh, of the spirit, like it says here. But it says enemy of God. So that means God is using a way to fight against your flesh. And what is that? That is the leap of faith that it takes for you to really submit your flesh to him to be born again and speak in other tongues. Because you have to... Um, you it's it's spirit it's uh led of the spirit yeah as 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 the spirit gives the utterance so you have to lay aside all of your flesh and i think that is us as a hurdle that a lot of people um that you know are coming to to church and trying to understand this they have a hard time understanding this aspect where you have to lay down your knowledge your uh right you're what you think, what you feel in your flesh, your tradition or tradition, your, yeah. you, what you think is your worldview and what yes. your opinions, none of that really matters. And, what really matters yeah. is being obedient yes. to the word of God. And that's yes. really a, what faith is really about. Yes. My, what I feel like is faith is talk about faith. It will lead you to that point yes. to get the carnality out and let the spirit come in is, is being obedient to the word of God. And that's why I say, listen, I tell people like, just try it. Like the, yeah. the the Bible talks about it. Why don't you give it a shot? Why don't you, you know, try try this? If you're if you're yeah. skeptical, read the Bible, see what the Bible says, and try to follow after after the Word of God. Try to just just give it a, give it a shot because this isn't necessarily a uh, denominational thing. Yeah. You know, we call ourselves Pentecostals <laughs> because you know we we use that to to kind of say, okay, it's it's easy to identify us because we believe that what what happened on the day of Pentecost. In Acts it's not two. it's not yep. that, you know, we're just, you know, we're so clingy to that word that but we're we're just using that as saying, listen, we we identify with with the experience that happened on the day of Pentecost. And we call ourselves self, self apostolics at times because we believe in the apostles doctrine. So that's not but this is whether you're, you know, Pentecostal <laughs> Uh, apostolic, whether you're, you know, Mormon, Jehovah's Witness, Catholic, Baptist, Lutheran, this is this promise is for everybody. Yeah. I there are there are people I know of all those denominations that have had the experience of having the Holy Ghost and speaking with tongues. Mm -hmm. And not only that, if you call yourself Pentecostal or apostolic and you've never had that experience speaking in tongues, and then that really that's irrelevant as well. Like all of that's yeah. irrelevant. This is something that is for everybody. This is something that no matter what you call you you call yourself, this this is for you, and this is something in the Word of God that we have to um, obey. Yeah, and it says uh, right at Acts two thirty nine, the promise is unto you and your children all afar off, even even as many as the Lord our God shall call. And then Peter goes on to write also, and ye are 
a royal, a peculiar people, a royal priesthood. Right. So it's not like it's just something special about Pentecostals or apostolics. It is any Christian who is born again. You are a new creature. You are a peculiar people, a royal priesthood. The because, only yes. prerequisite is to come to God with a humble heart, yeah, yeah. to have faith, come to be obedient to him and to repent of your sins. And, you know, I've known people that that after they've repented of their sins, that they've got the Holy Ghost before they were baptized. And I've known people, they've got the Holy Ghost after they were baptized. Mm -hmm. And and there's examples of that as well in the, in, in, in the book of Acts where, you know, once again, in Acts chapter 10, where Cornelius' family got the Holy Ghost. And then Peter said, can any man, for, can any man forbid water? Yeah. That these should not be baptized, seeing they have received the Holy Ghost. So Peter knew that they had received the Holy Ghost before they spoke with tongues. Well, now you got to get baptized. But then we also had have instances where they were baptized and then they received the Holy Ghost. And we can go back in the Old Testament and talk about the typology of all that and, you know, and, and explain that, you know, that is also foreshadowed in the Old Testament. You know, you have um, s certain tribes of Israel that crossed the River Jordan uh, you know, there before and after, and we can go into that, but we, we won't go into that now, yeah. but there is, there is credence, you know, to all through the scripture of, of the Holy ghost before and after baptism. But the prerequisite once again, is to come to him with a humble heart to be obedient to the word of God, to, you know, obviously have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, that he died for our sins and to repent of your sins, to come to him and just and, and repent and say, you and surrender yourself to the Lord and allow the Holy ghost to move into your life. Um, so I know, I, you know, I, and I know, I, I think we talked about this beforehand, how, you know, there's, there are also people that they, they get caught up with the gift of tongues. So yeah, it's, tongues is, it's definitely something that you have to lay aside your flesh to understand and you have to have faith. Um, but there is there in the Bible, it talks about the gift of tongues. So would you be able to kind of elaborate on the difference between what is really the gift of tongues and then what is um, the uh, speaking in other tongues, as it says in Acts 2. So the gift of tongues, the speaking in tongues when you get the Holy Ghost, that's the evidence of the Holy Ghost. The gift of tongues is one of the spiritual gifts that is used in, the op in operation and administration in a, a congregational setting in the body of Christ. Okay, yes. And so 1 Corinthians chapter 12, Paul says, now concerning spiritual gifts. Now, Paul had a lot of things to deal with in the Corinthians church. There was a lot of chaos and, and disorder going on in that church, like in, in, I guess you could say the services, but the gatherings. Yeah. People would get up and, and just say different things. And so he's saying, okay, I got to deal with this. Okay. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brother, and I would not have you ignorant. And then he goes on in verse four of first Corinthians chapter 12. Now there are diversities of gifts, but the same spirit. So you have the Holy Ghost, you get the spirit, but then... There's almost like an offshoot of that, a, a, a category or an administration of that. Um, but he said the same spirit. And there are difference of, uh, di differences of administrations, but the same Lord. There are diversities of operations, but it is of the same God which worketh all in all. But the manifestation of the spirit is given to every man to profit with all. For to one is given by the spirit, the word of wisdom, to another, the word of knowledge by the same spirit. And he goes on with the gifts of the spirit. Um to another faith by the same spirit, to another the gift of healing, the, by the same spirit, to another the gift of working of miracles, um, prophecy, discerning of spirits, and to another diverse kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. But all these, now listen to what he says, all these worketh that one and self same spirit, dividing to every man severally as he will, for as the body is one. So he's talking about the body, like in terms of the body of Christ as a collective whole. He's not talking about you at home and your personal walk with God and your personal prayer life mm -hmm. and your personal devotion and, and that intimate moment you have with the Lord. He's talking about in terms of the body of Christ and all the members of that one body being many are one body. So also is Christ. So it's a category. He's talking about just like you would have a house. Well, there's furnishings of the house. There's different rooms of the house. People have different gifts, but we all come the same way. Jesus said, I am the door. He who comes in another way is, just, is a thief and a robber. There's one door we come through, but once you come in the door, now there's different gifts that are, that are handed out. But when you go through that door, everybody is born in the kingdom the same way. And when you're born in the kingdom, you're going to receive the Holy Ghost and you're going to speak with tongues. Okay. We all need to come in that way. 
Now, in verse 27 of this same chapter, he says, Now ye are the body of Christ. So he's still talking about the body of Christ. And members in particular, and God hath set some in the church, first apostles, secondary prophets, thirdly teachers. He's dealing with all these administrative things because there's so much chaos in this church. Mm -hmm. Okay. After that, miracles, then gifts of healings, helps, governments, diversities of tongues. Then he says, are all apostles... Are all prophets, are all teachers, are all workers of miracles. Okay, still talking about these gifts and these different things that happen in a public church church setting. Mm -hmm. Have all the gifts of healing. Do all speak with tongues? Do all interpret? But covet, covet, covet earnestly the best gifts, and yet I show to you a more excellent way. So he's saying in a church setting, he's saying, you know, do do when you get up here, there, there's going to be different things, but they have to edify the body. So there's there's just different sounds. If I'm giving a speech or an announcement mm -hmm. in the church, if I'm giving a lesson or, or a teaching, it's going to sound differently than if I'm talking to you face to face. Yeah. It's going to sound differently. Matter of fact, there's going to be there's going to be order in that. When I get up, when when a preacher gets up to preach or teach, there's tip. You know, there's not a lot going on. If there is, people are like, you know, whose phone went off? <laughs> Who's you know whose baby's crying? And I, I, you know, I've had babies crying too. I'm not I'm not putting that down. I'm just saying, like, you know, there, there's certain things that happen you know, that, that are orderly. But if you walk into a church or, or a room and everybody's having a conversation, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's disorderly. Yeah. But Paul's saying, I want you to have order here. Okay. And the reason why he's saying that he's talking about when the church gets together and there's, there's people need edified, people need taught, people need growth. They need development. He's not talking about your personal conversation or your personal walk with God. Okay, so there's, you know, if I'm giving an announcement or speech, there's, there's, a, there's like if somebody's giving a State of the Union address, the president, yeah. there's a certain cadence, there's a certain, you know, it's a formal setting. But if it's in, a, if it's a more informal setting, the sound changes. Not everything is orderly per se. Now, if you go to First Corinthians chapter 14, it continues with this, verse five. It says, "I wouldn't, I would ha that ye all spake with tongues, but rather that ye prophesied." Okay. For greater is he that prophesieth than he that speaketh with tongues, except he interpret that the church may receive edifying. So he's talking about the church when it comes to these spiritual gifts, receiving edifying. Now, brethren, if I come to you speaking with tongues, he said, what shall I profit you except I shall speak to you either by revelation or by knowledge or by prophesying or by doctrine? So he's saying, if I come to you, if I come to the church speaking in a tongue, what is it going to edify you? You're going to be like, I don't understand what you're saying. It's just like if, yeah. if, if Peter went on the day of Pentecost after he received the Holy Ghost and gets up there and starts speaking in tongues, the Jews are going to be like, what is he saying? I don't understand any, any word he's saying, but he did. He spoke in a language that they understood because it was a public setting. Okay. So I'm going to skip over some of this stuff, but I want you to hear this one thing. It, 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 he says, um, now he comes down and he said in verse 27, he said, if any man speak in an unknown tongue, let it be by two. So now he gives... Yeah. Now he gives the criteria for if you're used in the gift of now, we're still talking about the gift of tongues and the administration of the church. If any man speak in an unknown tongue, let it be by two or at the most by three and that by course and let one interpret. Okay. But if there is no interpreter, let him keep silent in the church and let him speak to himself and to God. Okay. So he's saying, if you have something to say to the church, don't just get up there and speak in tongues it, it, unless there's an, he said, there has to be an interpreter there. There has to yeah. be somebody that has the gift of interpretation. Yeah. So if any man speak in an unknown tongue, let it be by two or at the most by three. Well, that's interesting because on the day of Pentecost, there was more or two, two <laughs> than two or three speaking with tongues. <laughs> yeah. So were they out of order? Were they disobeying? Were they, you know, uh, God is not the author of confusion. Yeah. That's funny because there were, I'm, 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 I'm assuming there was more in Cornelius's family other than two or three people. Yeah. When when the, the the apostles went down to Samaria and they all spoke with tongues, the Bible says, yeah. was it just two or three? Okay. So this is clearly not talking about the moment you receive the Holy Ghost the salvation, or, yeah. or yeah. even your own personal walk with God. This yeah. is talking about uh, edifying the church, getting up there, you know, get if you have a public proclamation to make, and yeah. in that time, you know, they would get up there and, and and the minister would read the scroll or read something to edify the church, the church body, the congregation. He's saying, listen, don't just get up there, you speak and you use your gift of tongues, and then you use your gift of tongues, and then you use your gift to get tongues. No one's gonna understand what's going on unless there's an interpreter. Matter of fact, 
don't let it be more than two or three. How about that? Yeah. And and then there has to be one interpreter. Okay. Just so everything is done in decency and in order. He's not saying when you're praying to God in your prayer closet and no one else is around, or you're worshiping the Lord and you're praying and the Holy Ghost comes over and you speak with tongues. He's not saying not that's not, not what this is talking about. Yeah. It's talking about the gift of tongues. And the last thing I'm going to say is this. In verse 39, it says, Wherefore, brethren, covet to prophesy. So Paul's this is the last thing he says to them. Covet to prophesy and forbid not to speak with tongues. Let all things be done decently and in order. So what he is saying, listen, he said, there's going to be people that are still going to be ignorant. He said of this, and they're going to maybe want to get up there and start speaking and start giving a, a thing in tongues. He said, he said, really, he said, this isn't about limiting the gift of tongues or limiting necessarily who speaks it. He said, but rather, why don't you seek to interpret instead of like, yeah. limiting one part, why don't you seek to excel more in another gift or excel more in a different administration of the spirit? That's what Paul is saying. So I think that, and when people want to know the difference, I wanted to cover that real quick because people have a, have a, have a, have may have questions about what the difference of that is. And, and there is a big difference yeah. and that is the difference. So in first Corinthians, Paul is obviously talking to a church that's already received the Holy ghost already been through the salvation plan has already been living for God. And now he's got issues to deal with in a public setting where people want to get their two cents in and want to use their gift. He said, I, he said, I understand you're zealous and you want to use your gift and the Holy ghost is working in your life. I understand you're zealous, but when you're using the gift of tongues or interpret or any of these gifts, healings, any of these gifts in the church, it has to be done in decency and in order for the effort edification, for the edification yeah. of the body. Yeah. And he, so that's what he was trying to explain in this chapter. So I don't want anybody to get confused about that. But if you could look through all the book of Acts, when people got the Holy Ghost, they spoke with tongues. When I look back through my family, you know, when, when my boys, when people that we know got the Holy Ghost, it's a special moment Yeah. when it happens and you see them speak with tongues and we can all celebrate once again and rejoice that this is happening, that there's a new birth taking place. Yes. He's not the God of confusion. Yeah. And, um, you know, thank you so much for clarifying that, especially the, the gift of tongues, because, you know, I think it can get, uh, pe you know, people can get it conflated. They can, they can either combine or, or, or in interchange some things, but it definitively says it in scripture. And thank you for coming on and, and showing us that and, and, and talking about it today. I think this is a great, uh, this will be a great tool for somebody that wants to understand salvation and wants to understand, uh, you know, firstly, our episode about spirit map, uh, about water baptism. And now this about spirit baptism, I think it's, I think it's essential f for anybody. So again, thank you. That was, that was great. And, um, yeah, with that, um, that, that'll be it for this episode. Of course, go to our YouTube channel for more extended versions of these episodes because over there you're going to get a lot more content but yeah thank you for watching and listening and god bless you